Okay, yes, I believe we started recording now. Yeah. So hello everyone. Apologies for the technical difficulties. It seems that Zoom has crashed at unfortunately the wrong time. Um, but thank you for joining us today. And um, do not worry because the session is being recorded. So my name is Ashwarya. I am the co-founder of NMRA. And today we are very, very fortunate to have with us Dr. Adil Rashid. So a quick introduction. Um, he attended medical school at Nottingham and he completed the academic foundation program um, in started in 2019, also at Nottingham. He is now doing an academic clinical fellowship in general surgery in Sheffield, South Yorkshire. And we're very, very fortunate to have you here today to tell us more about the AFP. And without further ado, I'll pass on to you. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. I'll just um, share my screen. Can you guys see that? Yes, we can. Great. So um, hello, everyone. Um, my name's Adil um, and I'm a surgical trainee working in South Yorkshire. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience of research at medical school and also my experience of the academic foundation program. It's just a quick note to mention that the Academic Foundation Programme is now called the Specialist Foundation Programme, but the principles are exactly the same. So my first experience of research came in my second year at university. Um, before that, I'd had no experience of, of research. Um, so when I was in my second year, we all got an email from one of the academic GPs called Dr Crawford, who you, you can see in this picture. And he was looking for a medical student um, to do a little bit of research looking at the impact of social media and how medical students can use social media to both interact with patients and also interact with other colleagues. So I applied um, for this project and was lucky enough to get it. Um, at the time in second year, I wasn't really sure what area of medicine I was interested in, but it was great um, to speak to one of the academic GPs and work closely and see how he was combining his career as a GP with research. As part of the project, um, I reviewed the literature around social media um, and how doctors can use it, and I learned about both the benefits and the harms that social media can bring. I mean, it was a really interesting project and gave me a, 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 a a taste of what research was like. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be able to present um, the results um, at a local uh, GP conference. And my work was also used as part of a policy for medical students to help them interact uh, professionally on social media. So moving on um, to my third year at medical school um, at Nottingham University, where I undertook a BMED side project. Um, so, uh, during this time, we spent six months getting involved um, in research and there were a lot of different areas where we can undertake this research. So initially, I was quite keen to do a clinical project working with patients. Um, but when I ranked my preferences, um, I actually ended up getting my last choice, which is an immunology. And um, at the start, I was quite disappointed. Um, I'd never worked in a lab before and it wasn't something that I thought would interest me. But actually, um, as I started to work alongside the other students in the lab and the PhD students and my supervisors, I really enjoyed that team working environment in the lab. Um, I enjoyed picking up new skills, um, learning about really technical uh, skills in the lab, such as flow cytometry. Um, at the time, we were also um, researching quite a niche area in immunology. Um, and although I had a small part to play in it, it did really feel exciting working on the kind of latest um, advances in this area. Um, and I think my experiences really taught me that although something might not seem, um, you know, at first glance might not seem what something that you'd be interested in, it really is important to, I would say, give it a go um, because you can learn lots of lots of new skills um, and really develop yourself as a person. And the thing that I learned in this case was particularly that team working aspect that um, as a researcher, you might think that you're just there by yourself working on projects, but actually you often work in very big teams with lots of different people at different stages of their research career and you can learn a lot from them. So at the end of my BMED Sci, uh, I graduated um, and again, I was able to present my work at a national conference. Um, 
And this is a picture of me at my graduation of my BMED Sci, which was a, a, a really great day, although very cold, as you can see from the picture. So then moving on into my clinical years, um, I developed uh, an interest in surgery. Um, and again, I wanted to carry on getting involved in research, but I wasn't really sure what the best way um, to do it was. Um, I knew there were a few um, surgeons around in the hospital who were getting involved in research, but um, I didn't really know the, the best way of contacting them or how to get started. Um, and one of the really great ways that, that was advertised to us as medical students was collaborative research groups. And the first collaborative research group that I started working with was um, MSAN, which is the East Midlands Surgical Academic Network. Um, and these are a group of surgical trainees and consultants um, that get together to work on research projects that are not just taking place in a single hospital, but are taking place potentially across the whole region or the whole country. And um, what I learned was really the power of collaboration and working with other centres um, across the country um, to produce research that really can change practice and has, and has a bigger impact than just a research project that's run locally. So the first um, audit that I was involved in um, was looking at uh, fasting times for patients undergoing emergency surgery. And we looked at the um, recommended guidelines for fasting times, um, which was six hours before surgery, and we, cared, and we compared them to the reality of what patients were experiencing. And we found that actually patients were being fasted for a longer period of time than they should be, which could have some de detrimental impacts. And this was a really important finding to highlight because as a result of this, we were able to implement some changes so that patients' fasting time were, were more efficient and more effective, and it ultimately improved their patient um, care and pathway. So through MSAN, I also learned about a different collaborative uh, research group called Star Search. Very similar to MSAN, this is a group of surgical trainees that runs collaborative projects through the whole country. And again, I was involved as a collaborator, um, collecting data at my local hospital, um, managing the data and uploading it onto a data management software so that this data could inform large nationwide studies. And one of the studies to mention is the one at the bottom, um, which was actually published um, in the British Journal of Surgery. And it was looking at the effectiveness of um, non-steroidals um, on patients undergoing colorectal surgery. And although I had you know, although we all had a small part to play um, and I only, you know, we collected about 10, uh, we collected um, data for around 10 patients each. When you actually put all the collaborators together and all of that data together, it really does produce powerful research that can help patients um, and help progress research. Um, so moving on um, to my fourth year in medical school, um, we all had the opportunity to undergo a special study module. So this is a four week placement where we can choose any specialty that we're interested in and have a, a flavour of that specialty. So for me, I knew I was interested in surgery, so I picked the colorectal surgery special study module, but you could pick any specialty that, that, that you wanted. Um, and for my um, uh, colorectal special study module, I was attached uh, to a surgeon um, that I knew was involved in research. So. Um, I approached him and asked if there was anything that I could get involved in. Um, and he again had a, a, a small research project that he was working on that I also helped with. Um, and this was looking at a novel procedure, surgical procedure for patients with faecal incontinence. Um, this was a procedure that had only just um, gone into clinical practice in the last few years. And it only performed this pre procedure on a small number of patients. So we wanted to look at how effective it was following this pa these patients up for months and, and years. And through this project, again, um, I learned lots of different skills. I developed my organisational skills. Um, I learned how to um, uh, uh, distribute surveys out to patients and interpret the results and learn how to follow patients up. And again, I was able to present the results at a, a national conference, um, which again developed some skills such as my presentation skills and uh, communication skills. So another way um, of getting involved in research is through um, student research societies. And at Nottingham, we had uh, a research society called Inspire. 
And this society really aimed to showcase the importance of research and encourage medical students to get involved in research. And in my final year, I um, joined the committee and helped the uh, society with the activities that it was involved in. So, for example, um, every year um, the society would organise a conference um, for medical students to come and present research that they'd been involved in and also gave an opportunity to hear from more senior academics about their uh, research experience. The society also organised um, lecture series where they invited uh, senior academics and um, recently they were lucky enough to uh, invite Henry Marsh to the University of Nottingham to come and get involved. Um, so for me, I found this society a great way to network with other students, uh, make you know lifelong friends and get involved in research. And if research is something that you want to get involved in, I definitely um, advise looking out for your local academic society and, and getting involved and seeing what they have to offer. Um, and if a university doesn't have um, uh, a local academic society, then you've always got NMRA, which is a fantastic uh, opportunity for you guys to learn more about research and get involved in research. So these are a few take home messages for my experience of uh, research at medical school. So I think especially as um, an early year medical student, it can be quite daunting thinking about research and thinking about how um, how to get involved in research. And I think a great way um, to get involved is start with um, those collaborative projects or speak to um, students in the year, but in, in more senior students who have been involved in research and get recommendations about which academics or um, which researchers to contact um, to get involved to, to, you know, to start your journey in research. Um, research is a great opportunity to learn um, and be inspired. And through my time in medical school, I did research in lo lots of different specialties from general practice to surgery. And it's great to learn the skills from those different specialties. And also during my time in my third year with my BMed Sci, a lot of the academics there were non-medics. Um, and again, it was great to learn from them, pick up the skills that they had. Um, the other thing that you learn with research is that failure is OK. Um, it's, you know, every academic and every researcher that I've spoken to, um, they've all told me about the times that things haven't go got, you know, things haven't gone right with their um, projects or papers haven't been accepted the first time to their journals, and that's that's completely okay. Um, every everything that you do is a learning experience when it comes to research, and as you progress, um, you'll pick up more skills and you'll develop yourself. Um, of course, as a medical student, you have lots of different competing interests. Um, so it's important to make sure you balance your time um, between your studies, um, between your extracurricular extracurricular activities and your your you know your um, own personal time. So um, it's great to get involved in research, but sometimes if you find that you're too busy, it's completely okay to say no to things. And the last thing is, um, which I think is really important, is that no matter what your previous experience is, anyone can get involved. And even if you, you know, get involved in research and find it's not for you, that's totally fine. At least you've given yourself an opportunity um, to try. So now I'll just move on and talk a little bit about the Academic Foundation Programme. So um, when it comes to the Academic Foundation Programme, it's slightly separate to the Foundation Programme and you have a separate application pro process. So normally, as part of the Academic Foundation Programme, you have a four month block where you undertake uh, your research. Um, the Academic Foundation Programme is a fantastic way to build your CV and explore your interests a little bit further, whether that's in research, teaching, leadership or management. You get some really fantastic benefits with the Academic Foundation Programme. And for me, the biggest one was having that protected time where you could concentrate on your um, research. You didn't have to worry about your clinical commitments during that time. Depending on the places that you apply, you also get extra funding to spend on travel and to attend conferences. You also get access to university facilities such as their local, local libraries and software such as statistical packages. Um, and again, the important thing is, is that just by applying, you've got nothing to lose. Um, and again, 
when it comes to the academic foundation program, they're not looking for someone um, who is already, uh, you know, an accomplished academic. They're looking for someone with an interest in research and someone that has the potential um, to get involved in research. So um, how do you apply? So when it comes to the academic foundation program, you can only apply to two separate um, deaneries. Um, so for me, I knew that I wanted to stay around in the Nottingham area because that's where I'd done my undergraduate degree. So I only applied to one, but you do have the uh, option to apply to up to two. Um, each deanery has a slightly separate um, application process. Um, but broadly, as part of the application process, there's a white space question um, section. Um, so, for example, one of the questions that you might get asked is um, to explain why you wish to apply for the academic foundation programme. They might also ask a little bit about your previous research um, experience as well. And when it comes to the scoring, it scores slightly different to the foundation programme. So um, if you have any um, poster or oral presentations or any prizes or publications that often contributes to the scores um, and can help boost your chances of um, getting onto the academic foundation programme. So um, unlike the foundation programme, the academic foundation programme um, also has an interview. Um, again, depending on where you apply, the structure of the interview differs. Um, so I can speak a little bit about the Nottingham process. So at Nottingham, they had um, two separate stations. Um, each station was around 10 minutes each. Um, and each station was assessing something slightly different. So the first station was assessing um, your ability to critically appraise a paper. So you were given um, a full paper, an abstract before the interview and you were asked to read the paper um, and explain what you understood about the paper. So when it comes to critically appraising, um, when you read a paper, it's also important to understand the strengths and the weaknesses of the paper and if there's any potential biases within the paper. So things like selection bias, um, attrition bias. And the other thing to know is whether this paper has external validity. So for example, whether you can take the results of the study and apply it to your pa patient population. And I'll talk a little bit about some resources to help you when it comes to critically appraising a paper. Um, the other station was um, more focused around your motivations uh, for the academic foundation program. So a little bit about why you wanted to do the academic foundation program and also your understanding um, of the, you know, the benefits and the challenges of doing an academic foundation program. Sometimes they might also ask about your understanding of medical ethics um, and the importance of medical ethics um, when undertaking research. Um, I know that in some other areas um, you might also get uh, questions around clinical scenarios. So, for example, they might want to um, assess some of your clinical skills. They might give you a scenario where you're the junior doctor um, and you're, you come across a patient presenting with, for example, chest pain, or you might have a number of different patients and you have to justify how you would um, uh, prioritise those. So, um, although it can seem quite daunting talking about the interview process, um, there's lots of great resources out there that can help you and there's a lot of preparation that you can do um, so that you feel ready when it comes uh, to, the, to the interview day. So the other thing to think about is um, what area of the country that you want to apply to. So for me, I knew that I wanted to stay local to the Nottingham area. Um, and you've got to think that you're going to be spending the next two years in this uh, part of the country. So you want to pick a part of the country that, you know, would suit you, suit your interests. The other thing to think about is how each of the different deaneries run the academic foundation programme. So, for example, in the East Midlands, when it comes to doing a research orientated academic foundation programme, you are not tied down to a specific uh, specialty. So, for example, I knew I was interested in surgery. So um, there was a list of different supervisors and I picked um, the supervisor that, 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 that was a surgeon. But say, for example, if I was interested in uh, cardiology or a different specialty, I could go and find um, a supervisor in that area. 
again in the East Midlands, you, you, you had some influence about what project you picked. Um, so often a supervisor would already have a project for you, but if you wanted to adjust it slightly or if you wanted to work on something different, this is something that you could speak to your supervisor and organise. Um, in comparison, other deaneries might already have a supervisor and a project title set up. Um, so it's important to do a little bit of research before and check out what's on offer in each of those deaneries. Um, I've mainly spoken about the um, research side of the academic foundation programme, but there are other um, alternatives that you can do and there are other ways that you can spend those four months. So, for example, you could choose to do the leadership and management foundation programme, which is where during those four months, um, you'll often be attached to one of the leaders in the hospital, whether that's one of the clinical directors or chief executives. You'll shadow them and you'll pick up lots of skills on how hospitals and departments are managed. And there might also be opportunities to undergo leadership and management courses to develop your skills. Another um, type of uh, academic foundation programme is based on medical education. So during your, uh, during your four month block, um, you'll be delivering uh, uh, teaching sessions to medical students, um, getting involved in things like simulation and um, also getting involved in further courses in medical education. So, you know, you might not necessarily be interested in research, but if you're interested in leadership and management or teaching, this is also a great way to develop your skills. So these are a couple of reasons um, why you should do the Academic Foundation Programme. So it's a great way for you to explore your interests, whether that's in research, teaching or leadership. Um, you have the benefit of protected time um, where you don't have to worry about going into the hospital and doing your clinical work. You have time where you're purely dedicated to doing your, your research or your teaching or your leadership work. Um, it really does develop a lot of your non-clinical skills, so um, it's a great way to develop your communication skills, um, a great way to develop some of your critical appraisal and research skills. Um, you also have a budget to attend courses and conferences. Um, as an academic foundation programme, there's lots of opportunities to network both with supervisors, but also with other academic, um, academic foundation doctors and academic clinical fellows. And it's a great way to boost your CV and continue a pathway um, in academic training. Um, of course, with anything, there are some challenges. Uh, so as I've mentioned before, um, when it comes to academic academia, um, there are always setbacks um, along the way um, and can be something that's difficult to deal with. But for me, uh, I remember when um, I was submitting my first paper as an academic foundation doctor and it initially got rejected and it was something that was really difficult to, uh, you know, to, to kind of take because I'd spent so many hours and worked so hard on it. Um, but, you know, I spoke to my supervisor about it and, you know, something that happens very often. And again, we went back, worked on it, worked on the feedback and eventually uh, and I, was, I was able to resubmit it and it got accepted um, as a publication. Um, it is important to note that by doing the academic foundation program, you will have four months less of clinical time. Um, so you won't have as much time to develop your clinical skills, but you'll still be expected to hit those same clinical um, benchmarks as your peers. Um, this is completely achievable. It's just important that you're organized, um, you're proactive um, in getting those clinical skills during your rotation and getting those case-based discussions and those um, CBDs sorted early on. The other thing to mention is that often, because you have one less clinical rotation, you might not have as much choice when it comes to your other clinical rotations. So if you know that you want to do um, a specific set of rotations, you might find that those options aren't there if you do go for the academic foundation program. So it's something to think about. Another thing that's really important to mention is that even if you choose not to go for the academic foundation program, you can still get involved in research. Um, you can still get involved in teaching medical students. You can still uh, attend uh, conferences. So um, it's important just to say that even if you're not doing the academic foundation program, you can still um, really develop the skills that we've spoken about. 
So I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, career progression when it comes to um, an academic medicine career. So um, at the bottom, um, this is the pathway of uh, the, the academic career. And at the top, this is the clinical career. So um, we all start in medical school where we spend five or six years. During that time, we had the opportunity to do special study modules. Some universities offer Bachelor of Sciences and some students might want to take some time out to do a PhD during their medical school training. So after that, we have the option of doing the foundation program or the academic foundation program. And then going on from there, we start our core training in whichever specialty that is. So for example, that might be a medical specialty, it might be a surgical specialty, it might be GP, radiology, um, A&E, um, whichever specialty you're interested in. And you can either do the full, the, the kind of clinical um, route, or you can do the academic route. So after the academic foundation program or your foundation program, you can choose to apply for an academic clinical fellowship. So as an academic clinical fellow, you spend 75% of your time doing your clinical skills. So working in the specialty of your choice, and then you spend 25% of your time um, doing research. And over a three year period, that gives you nine months of research. And during that time, um, you'll be again getting involved in research and potentially working towards an application for a PhD. So at that time, after your fellowship, you might decide to come out of training and do spend three years doing a PhD or two years doing an MD to develop your, your research skills. And then you can go back and work as a clinical lecturer at this stage, you're working as a registrar, so you're working as a senior doctor in your chosen specialty. And as a clini clinical lectureship, normally you have a 50-50 split. So you might spend two and a half days on the wards um, in, you know, with patients in clinics, um, and then you'll spend the other two and a half days of your week doing research. And then finally, at the end, um, you'll apply to be a lecturer or an assistant professor. So it's really important to mention that if you are in the um, clinical pathway, you can um, apply to go into the academic pathway. And if you're in the academic pathway and you decide that you don't want to continue with your research, you can go back to the clinical pathway. So um, for example, even if you do the, found, the foundation program, you can still go on and apply for the academic clinical fellowship and continue your academic training. And it's it's designed to be flexible so you can switch back and forth from each of these uh, training pathways. Um, the other thing to mention as well is that as you develop through the academic pathway, um, you, you, you gain skills just as you would clinically in research. So for example, as an academic foundation program, you might, as an academic foundation doctor you might be working with a supervisor working on a project that they've designed but as you progress through um, you will then start developing your own research ideas you'll start developing your own research teams applying for your own grants and finding your own area of research of interest so just talking a little bit about my research project during the academic foundation program so I was supervised by um, one of the um, associate professors in colorectal surgery Mr Younes and I undertook a systematic review, a meta-analysis. And I was looking specifically at patients with liver disease um, who had undergone an operation to take their appendix out. So this was an area where there wasn't much data out there. And during the systematic review, I developed a search strategy um, where I could find all the relevant papers. And we were able to identify four studies that had looked at this. And we combined all the results um, using statistical uh, analyses um, to try and figure out what the risk was of having an appendicectomy if you also had liver disease. And the reason that we wanted to do this was to really help patients with liver disease make informed decisions um, about their surgery and also to help surgeons decide about whether it was safe to, uh, to offer this surgery to their patients. So as a result of the systematic review, um, we found that although there was higher risk in patients with liver disease, there was very little data out there. So we went on to do an epidemiological study um, where we used national databases of hospital and GP records 
again to look at the same um, to look at the same uh, statistics, to look at mortality following appendicectomy in patients with liver disease. And the study really helped to address the gap in the research base um, and again help patients and surgeons. So I, I really did um, enjoy my uh, time, uh, my four month block doing research. Um, it was a great way to uh, learn about the process of getting of, of undertaking research, identifying gaps in the research base and trying to address questions, um, research questions to help uh, patients and clinicians. Um, I also didn't work by myself. I had a big team around me, so I was working with PhD students, academic clinical fellows um, and helping also helping them with their research projects and gaining a lot of skills and experience from them as well. So it really was um, a great experience. Um, through this, I was able to present my findings again at national conferences, um, and I was able to publish uh, the systematic review. So just finally to finish, um, talk, just uh, to signpost you guys to a couple of really useful resources. So this is the official foundation program website. Um, that has a lot more information about the academic foundation program, um, the application process, the interview process, and exactly what the academic foundation program involves. Um, there's a key document section, which I've taken a picture of here with some great um, resources. So you can access um, the white space questions that each of the different deaneries ask. Um, and it also goes through the number of uh, academic foundation program um, spaces in each of the deanery and whether they're allocated to research or medical education or teaching and leadership. Um, the two books on the side are um, the books that I use to help me prepare um, for the interview process. So the one on the right um, is a is a book um, that goes through how to critically appraise um, an academic paper. It's really concise. Um, you can probably go through it in a, in a couple of hours and it just breaks down the different steps to um, uh, understanding a, a clinical a, a research paper. It goes through the different types of bias, how to interpret them, um, the difference between um, external and internal validity. It goes through basic statistical models on how to interpret things like p-values and confidence intervals. And it's a great um, tool, um, not only just to prepare for the academic foundation program, but also as you're going through medical school and getting involved in research or reading research papers. And the book on the um, left um, is more of a, a general book to prepare you for interviews. Um, and it covers lots of different uh, examples of potential questions and it has great model answers. Um, so it goes through clinical questions, medical ethics questions, um, and I found it really useful. So thank you very much um, for listening um, and please feel free to let me know if you have any questions at all. I'll stop sharing my screen now. OK, so thank you very much, Dr. Rashid, for that. Um, it was really nice uh, to hear about your personal journey and thank you for giving us a detailed insight into the Academic Foundation programme. And I'm sure that the resources that you've shared will be very helpful for many of the um, people that have joined the meeting today. Um, so we do have a few questions. Um, to kick things off, uh, there's a question from my end, which is, so you mentioned that you would find a supervisor uh, for your um, research. And so what sort of things were you considering and how did you go about finding a supervisor? Because I think that's perhaps something that isn't quite talked about as much. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so um, in the East Midlands, um, we were given a list of different uh, supervisors, um, one supervisor for each area. So for example, we had one supervisor for general surgery, one supervisor, for example, for respiratory, one for radiology. And for me, I found there was a couple of things that I did. So the first thing that I did was I did a quick Google search of the supervisor. And one thing that's really important to look at is the track record of that supervisor. So for example, um, it's good to see how many papers they're publishing, um, how many grants that they've won, um, because if you've got a supervisor that has a track record um, of publishing, especially 
publishing papers with, ac with previous academic foundation doctors, it really um, gives you the confidence that the supervisor has lots of experience and there's a good chance that working with the supervisor, you'll get outputs such as presentations and publications. Um, I think the other thing that's really important is to try and talk to um, uh, you know, people that, that have already been supervised by um, whichever supervisor you're interested in and ask them what their experience was. So, for example, um, when I was applying, um, there was a sh there was an academic foundation program in the year above um, and I had a quick chat with them and, um, you know, found out a little bit about how the supervisor works, um, whether because each supervisor will have a different way of supervising. So some supervisors will give you a lot of freedom and um, give you a lot of time, whereas other supervisors might want to um, monitor you a little bit more closely and interact a little bit more closely and check up on you so for me i knew with my style i needed someone that would be you know making sure that i was hitting my targets and uh and progressing well and this was something that when i you know spoke to other people they said that you know, this supervisor has this style very approachable very uh keen to help junior trainees and if you look back over the last four or five years, every year with that, which, whichever academic foundation doctor that he'd worked with, he'd managed to get um, publications and uh, um, presentations. So I think the supervisor is something that's really, really important. And I think especially as uh, early years medical students, it could be quite daunting to figure out who to approach or which supervisor to go to. So I think they're the, the two main things. So number one, look at the track record and number two try and speak to other people that have worked with that supervisor amazing that's great um i think that's something that many people will definitely keep in mind um so we have a few questions come in into the chat so the first question um thanks for the talk adil what's the competition like for the afp yeah that's that's also a really good question so um uh, I applied in 2019, so things changed from year to year. Um, but from my experience, I found that the competition does vary between which area of the country that you apply to. Um, so, for example, as with the foundation programme, there are certain areas, for example, London, potentially Oxford, Cambridge, where their foundation programmes tend to be, a, their academic foundation programmes tend to be a little bit more um, competitive and more sought after. Um, and you might find that more people are applying uh, to, to, to those areas. Um, what I would say, though, is that try not to try not to look too much into the competition ratios. I think if you are interested in research um, and there's a particular area of the country that you want to work in or you want to live, um, I would just go for it, put the application in. You've got absolutely nothing to lose. Um, whilst you're at medical school, a really good thing to do is look at the scoring matrix and look at what each of those different deaneries are looking out for. So some deaneries might place more emphasis on your um, on, 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 on things like your prizes. Some might be looking for if you've got any publications, if you've got any uh, um, presentations, and that's how you can really boost your, your chances. Um, just what I would say as well is that when I applied to the Academic Foundation programme in Nottingham, I didn't have any publications at all. Um, I had a couple of local presentations um, and I was able to get on. So sometimes it can be a little bit daunting because you might hear things um, about needing, you know, about, about needing lots of different publications and lots of things on your CV. Um, but I think, you know, do what you can at medical school. Um, and if you are interested in research, go for it. They're not looking for someone that tick, you know, that is a, an accomplished academic. They're looking for someone that they can try and, you know, give a taste of what research is like. And if you and if you do like it as an academic foundation doctor, you can continue your academic career, you know, as an academic clinical fellow. Wonderful. Um, OK, another question is, how do you make the most of your supervisor during a research project, i.e. how would they help during a systematic review? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the the biggest piece of advice that I would give uh, as an academic foundation doctor is to start early. So um, my four month block was at the end of my second year foundation to the end of my F2. But before I started my F1, 
we, you already um, had an idea of who your supervisor was. So I contacted my supervisor at the start of F1 and um, contacted them, had a meeting with them, figured out what our project would be. And for a systematic review, you can do uh, you can do the groundwork and you can do a lot of the preliminary work before that four month block. So um, I'd never done a systematic review before. So I spoke to my supervisor. He advised me on how to undertake a systematic review. But of course, supervisors are very busy. So he also um, signposted me to a course, an online course on how to undertake a systematic review. And he paired me up with one of his PhD students as well. So um, as well as you know having very frequent meetings with my supervisor to troubleshoot any problems, by, under, by t taking the course, I had a really good idea of what I should be doing. Um, so I think the key thing is um, start early. Um, there are lots of different courses and things that you can do, especially online, um, to try and help you with systematic reviews. Um, so that meant that when I got to my four month block, I'd already done a lot of my, I'd already done the search strategy. I'd already um, identified, I'd already screened the papers and identified the papers for inclusion so that during my four months, I could just sit down, concentrate and write the paper um, with the support of my supervisor. Uh, that sounds great and um, yeah I think also I think following on quite nicely from that is we do currently have a research mentorship scheme um, that's ongoing for in case any of the participants are unaware of and within that um, some of the NMRA committee as internal mentors will uh, supervise you through that and then we also have external mentors to touch base too um, so in terms of how we are able to help you through that, well, we have our education series, um, which takes you through every step of how to do it. And even then, um, we sort of will have regular meetings, perhaps once a week, once a fortnight, um, to see um, how, well, each step, well, we'll give you an overview of the plan. We'll take you through each step and see how you're doing. And of course, we're here in case there are any questions. Um, so the next time we open it up, um, do you definitely keep a lookout for that. Um, so we have another question. Um, Marion, would you like to ask that? Hi, yes. Um, I was just wondering, um, in terms of your protected time, can you um, kind of split it over as many months as you want, or do you have to take it all in one go at the end of your AFP year? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, each deanery will run their academic foundation program slightly differently. Um, often you don't have much flexibility in how you take your academic time. So, for example, at Nottingham, um, you had a four month block um, and you took all your academic time in that in that four month block. And you could either, you had to have it in your second year of foundation. So you had to have it in your F2 and you could choose whether you wanted it to be your first, second or third rotation. Um, so for me, I um, had it as my third rotation, so right at the end of my foundation program. Um, other deaneries do things slightly differently. So, for example, you might find that um, in other deaneries, they split it into two two month blocks. So you might have one block in F1 and one block in F2. Um, and you might find that other deaneries you have day release. So, for example, you might spend one day a week um, as doing your academic time. So from what I know, as a foundation doctor, it often as it often depends on how your deanery runs the academic foundation program. Um, however, as you progress, so for example, as an academic clinical fellow, you have a bit more flexibility and say about when you take your research time. So if you prefer taking day release, um, you have more of a say in um, asking for that. If you prefer taking those blocks of time, again, you can ask for that. So uh, yeah, so I think great question. I think it, it depends on your deanery. Um, I think both ways have their pros and cons. So for example, I enjoyed having that four month block because it meant that I could just focus and really build momentum and um, you know I can whenever I wanted to I can meet my supervisor um, and it was great for continuity but again doing one day a week helps with certain projects um, that you, you know for example like systematic reviews it might be more useful to have one day a week whereas if you're doing a lab project you might prefer to have those bigger blocks where you could be spending time in the lab. Thank you so much that makes so much sense.
So we have one more question that's come through to me. So in terms of um, when you have your supervisor and you're doing the project with them, um, so do you, does, does your supervisor have any clear expectations for the outcome in your protected research time? E.g. are they expecting for you to kind of have a publication by that point or um, a, a certain amount done in that period of time? How does that work? Yeah, so yeah, so good question. So um, so when I did the academic foundation programme, there was no c clear expectation that we had to get a publication or a presentation. Um, my supervisor, um, when we first met, um, and I, I already knew from doing my research that he had a great track record. So when we met, when he sat down with me, one of the expectations was that we would try and aim for a publication. We would aim for um, a poster or oral presentation at a national conference. Um, and I think it's always good to aim for those things. Um, whether you achieve them or not, um, it, it's, it's completely OK. Um, it won't stop you from progressing. It won't stop you from passing your uh, kind of research block. Um, as long as you're engaging with your supervisor, as long as you're working hard and um, doing what's expected of you, um, whether you have your uh, research published or not, will not, you know, it's not a, a set criteria of having to progress in, you know, for, in, in having to pass your academic foundation pr program. So I guess a bit long winded, but I guess in summary is to say that um, during that research time, I think it's good to try and aim for those things, to aim for publications, to aim for presentations. But if, you know, if you don't get them, it, that's not the end of the world. Um, you know, the ultimate aim of the foundation program is to give you that sh that short taste, because ultimately you only have four months and in research, four months is not a long time. You know, people have spent three years doing a PhD study. Um, so, you know, no one is expecting um miracles in four months um if you know if you can get a publication that's amazing you've done you've done really really well if not that's not a problem at all you would have still picked up a lot of skills doing what you've done you know whether that's time management organizational skills writing skills um lo lots of different things so it's not all about as you know the outputs are good to aim for and will help you but it's not all about that Um, so from um, my end, I don't believe that I have any more questions. Um, and I, I don't believe. Okay. Hi. Uh, so in most of the applications for SFP, they have like a lot of columns for like prizes and publications, etc. And looking at that, it's pretty daunting because I think the one, the Birmingham application has like 10 columns for, for publications. Um, the London one has five. But do we need as many as that? Or is it just to scare us? <laughs> So I think it it so it's very difficult for me to say because I think every year that like, the competition will vary and every year the standard of applications changes. So I can only talk about my personal experience. So um, I do know that you know places like London, Cambridge, Oxford, they might have a higher expectation just because they have more people applying. So in those types of deaneries. Um, having a publication, having prizes, I think probably will put you in a, you know, in a, in a much stronger position and give you a better chance um, to get onto the academic foundation program. Having said that, uh, I, for example, when I applied, I had I had no publications. Um, I had I think I had two or three presentations, um, and I had a prize for my one prize for my B Med side project, um, and and I and I managed to get on. And I do know. Um, colleagues that had, you know, that didn't have prizes um, that that got on. So I think, again, it will depend on the deanery that you apply for. It will depend on the year that you're applying. But I think if you can show that, you know, you you've um, been motivated enough to get involved in research, um, and if you're able to demonstrate that, so whether that's collaborative research, whether that's audits. Um, whether that's you know approaching your local one of your local supervisors and getting involved with with the research that they're doing, I think that's the key thing because you've got to remember that you know getting involved in research, you're going above and beyond, you're showing initiative. Um, so I think it it is daunting, um, it is difficult, um, you know, seeing the application process and seeing all those things that are lifted in terms of publications and prizes. 
what I would say is I think during medical school, try and try and do as much as you can. Um, obviously, prioritize you know your medical exams, and you've got other things that you need to prioritize as well. Um, try and aim for those things. But if you know if you don't get them, still apply because they, there are there are also points for your white space questions. So if you're able to demonstrate in your white space questions, your commitment, um, your motivation, you can make up points there as well. So um, what I would say is you know. If, if you don't have publications, um, it's not the end of the world. You can make up those points elsewhere um, and just give it a go. Just just apply um, and that's the only way you'll know whether you'll, you know, you'll get the place or not. And the other thing to say is even if you don't get on the academic foundation program and you do the foundation program, you can still get involved in research. You can still get involved in teaching. You can still get involved in leadership. And then after that, you might decide to apply for the academic clinical fellowship um, and get get onto the academic program that way. So just because you're not on the academic foundation program doesn't mean that that's the end of your research career. Um, there's lots of different opportunities elsewhere. Thank you so much. Just one last thing. So you're yeah. doing it in Nottingham, am I right? Or you didn't? Yeah. I, I did my academic foundation program in Nottingham. Yeah. Is it two years in Nottingham or is it one year in Nottingham and one year in a DGH outside Nottingham? Yeah, so um, so at Nottingham, you have, so when I did it, you had one year at Nottingham uh, in the tertiary centre, and then you had one year in Derby. Um, I think that since uh, I've done the Academic Foundation programme, it's changed so that you have one year in a DGH like Lincoln and one year in um, in, in Nottingham. But I think the, the, the key thing is, is that each deanery is slightly different. So for example, from speaking to someone in Leeds, for their academic foundation program, they spent both their two years in the big teaching um, tertiary centre in Leeds, in the centre of Leeds. So uh, the key thing is to try and see if you can, if you know someone who's in the deanery that you're interested in and try and chat to them and figure out which hospitals they were in. I think you can also find that online as well on the foundation program website, but it's definitely a good thing to think about because you want to be thinking about where you're going to be living in the commute and things like that and which hospital you're going to be working in. So um, definitely a good question and something to, yeah, to, to kind of check depending on which deanery you're in. Awesome. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Are there any other questions from the people who are still here? OK, so I'm going to take that as a no. If there if anyone still does have still does have any questions, um, feel free to get in touch with us either by social media um, or send us an email and we can always um, uh, send that through to you. Um, so um, I believe that's it. Marion, is there anything else from your end? Um, no, I think we're good. Um, we just need the feedback form, but since we don't have that many people joining, I suppose we can just email everyone the feedback form due to our technical difficulties. Um, so we can just do that um, through the feedback form and through an email, but we're all good. Okay, so yeah. We're all good then from our end. So thank you very much, Dr. Rashid. Uh, this has been incredibly helpful, not only for myself, but I'm sure for everyone else who is able to attend and hopefully for the people who are watching the recording too. No problem. Thank you for inviting me to speak. <laughs>